so thank you very, very much. I'm really privileged to be here, and I'm sorry that the other speaker couldn't make it, but it's made an opportunity to talk about um, mainly fungi. But I think if you take fungi as representative of other huge groups of organisms that really don't get a mention, even in the time of discussion of biodiversity, which we thought would be a great leveling of the playing field for those interested in insects, bacteria, and fungi. But uh, it hasn't quite worked out that way. Um, so I just want to take you on a little, it is me, road trip. Um, around Ireland, but around the theme of mycology in particular. Um, I suppose uh, what we have here is Amanita muscaria, and a lot of people have given it a lot more thought in recent times as the fly agaric uh, from uh, hallucinogenic therapies of a sort, if you're into that, to a much more um, focused look now from a medicinal point of view especially as a psychotherapy drug. We're looking at the spore producers as opposed to the pollen producers. And spores and pollen in the overlapping area don't look that different from each other, but it's a fundamentally different categorization project that went on through Linnaeus and others uh, to subdivide the kingdom of plants into non-spore producers, pollen producers, and spore producers. So among these spore producers, we have the mosses. Um, this is a pogonatum with beautiful uh, capsules at the top. And the spores emanate from these. We have liverworts, a mancantia here and with beautiful structures. Again, the idea is to raise the capsule and the release mechanism so that the spores are available to the air over the surrounding vegetation. We have ferns and their allies. Um, not many ferns in Ireland, we have about 50, uh, but the allies make up greater numbers and for a small group, they're not really studied all that well. So we're just looking at um, a couple of other additional versions. And these are quite primitive plants. Um, we have, uh, I suppose, evidence of plants uh, of these spore producers from over 400 million years ago and going way, way further back possibly as well. It's just that soft body preservation doesn't occur very often. And then we have the algae, which can be free living, um, coastal um, marine algae, seaweeds, and also freshwater algae, and free living algae that can also live in the company of fungi in a lichen symbiosis. So just looking at lichenized fungi. So we don't separate the lichens from the other fungi. They're all fungi. Um, the difference for lichens is that you usually have uh, a fungal uh, association with an algal set of cells or a layer within the fungal body. Or you can have a fungal cyanobacterial association, as in the case here. And these species tend to be uh, in wet areas. Ireland has some wonderful cyanobacterial lichen areas, but they are limited to old ancient woodland, uh, semi-natural woodland. Uh, the linguistics kind of gets interchangeable, but they are distinct. And also um, on rocks, sometimes left behind. So we've seen huge erratic rocks in the west of Ireland that have um, had Scots pine growing over them in the past. Um, but over time, those pines have disappeared. And the Briaria species of lichens now live on the rocks that remain because they're, they're just so huge that until recently, you couldn't move them very easily, so everybody left erratic rocks sitting where they were. 
Um, but these can be hoarders and the only remnant and evidence that there were Scots pines in the area that held these species on their branches in the past. So we also have script lichens, the graphis um, and other script forming. I won't get into the Latin too much because I think you just lose people. And um, as these are huge groups, uh, each of these genera tend to have upwards of 100 species in Ireland. But some are much smaller, of course, and neat. Then we have the cladonias. Uh, they can form a range of different structures. But this is the cup-forming cladonia. Um, it has little uh, fruit bodies at the very top. If for those in the front, you might just see little tiny red dots around the edges. And then we're on to the non-lichenized fungi. So uh, bracket fungi like this, uh, chicken of the woods, later porous sulfurous. Uh, <coughs> and then we have amine amanita group. Uh, some of the deadly poisonous fungi are within the white spored amanitas, but they're quite common in Ireland and it is possible to pick them up inadvertently. We've had a few um, accidents with uh, selection of amanitas. They tend to look quite like uh, species in Asia that are grown commercially uh, like the paddy straw mushroom and the mistake can be made here when these species are quite young and with devastating consequences for the people who eat them. And then we have the uh, bolete family. So these have pores instead of gills uh, as fungi but they have a stem and um, yeah, that's basically it. It's really just a, a colorful show of what's out there. Uh, we also have hedgehog mushrooms, and these have spines or spikes instead of pores uh, or gills. Uh, and some of the lovely species to eat include hiddenum rapandum. I think the, the French call it pied de mouton, so it's a prized edible species. And then I'll just show spores. Um, the tuber A. stevum spores that I was studying a uh, while back uh, have quite beautiful ornament around the edge. So the kingdom fungi is a vast group of organisms alone. Uh, often they are in association with helper bacteria and um, estimates of the numbers of fungi in the kingdom have varied over time with our developing knowledge and how we define species, I suppose, that old bugbear of biology students in college and beyond. Uh, so estimates in the 1990s went from 1.5 million species globally of fungi, and that was David Hawksworth, who was probably laughed out of it at the time. But um, a recent estimate by Kevin Hyde, based on the high throughput sequencing analysis, would put the number at the upward number at 13.2 million species of fungi. Okay, I'll leave that with you because bacteria are so much more and insects are vast as well. So you're dealing with very huge <coughs> groups of organisms. For instance, in comparison in Ireland, when we have a fairly poor flora, there are uh, 70 to 100 species of birds between those who live here and main visitors. Uh, vascular plants without garden varieties, 900 native Irish species. Um, mosses and liverworts, mosses 500 species odd. These are general numbers. Liverworts, 230 species recorded. That's about 730 for the bryophytes. So we're looking at 12,000, 12, sorry, um, 1,250 lichenized and 4,300 non-lichenized fungi in Ireland already recorded. How many of those are protected, we'll come to. Um, so what is a fungus? Uh, it's quite complicated and there are different types of fungi and they live in different places around our planet. We have freshwater moulds, we have slime moulds are kind of off on their own uh, now in the Protoctus, but these uh, 
beautiful creatures. Some of them can go into an animal phase. We're dealing with a group that is um, very different from the plant kingdom to which they were put with in botany over the centuries. But our main interest are ascomycetes and basidiomycetes for the nature of this talk. And so when we look at the spread, we're looking at dicaria, the ascomycetes, basidiomycetes, and then there's a whole raft of other more um, minor fungi that are now quite well understood by genetic analysis in their relationships to each other and to us. So at the bottom of this graph, you see animals, including us, so we're quite closely related to the fungi. <coughs> Revolution in mycological taxonomy. I'm still trying to get my head around it. I did, thanks to Trinity College's uh, and Friends Generosity, I do a few years of genetic work with them and um, discovered an awful lot uh, of uh, techniques and uh, the fun of that work. But, um, so we're going from optical features now to next generation sequencing quite rapidly and using uh, OTUs, these operational taxonomic units, in order to define different species in this fungal tree of life, in an overall tree of life genetic-based project, which is now getting on to genomic sequencing for some species. So. It's a good time, I always say, say to people now, to start mycology because all of the names have changed due to this revolution. And what we thought were closely related species optically have turned out genetically not to be so. And so everything's being recategorized and there's quite a race on to do that, as you can imagine. Everyone wants to be the next Linnaeus and describe new orders. So um, th yeah, the weeding out of the problematic stuff will come later and unfortunately fall on a lot of people to, to sort out the problems of, of the initial kind of uh, categorization project, but that's part of uh, progress. So the fungal tree of life, we're starting to get more and more unfamiliar with, and uncomfortable maybe, with how life is defined, how these groups are. I mean, it's quite alien and our knowledge of these some of these are soil fungi that cannot be cultured or not cultured easily, cannot be seen outside of genetic results. You know, we're getting really into a whole new realm of understanding and we're still just scratching at the surface. I think Ursula was totally right about that. And yet we're messing with these whole systems that we don't understand hardly at all or not at all. Um, so just to go back, the biology of fungi, uh, fungi perform various uh, roles, and, um, but, but in themselves they're commensal to symbiotic, they're helpful fungi. Um, there are fungi that live saprobically, they uh, eat vegetation and animals, actually anything that dies and falls down, um, they crunch up and make the material available for the next generations. Uh, fungi can be parasitic and pathogenic, and things can move between their roles as well. A parasitic fungus can become much more pathogenic, especially with climate change or being moved around the world. And one of the biggest issues is global supply chains. So i just ask a quick question. How many countries do you think Ireland takes plant material now, live and dry plant material from into Ireland from other countries in the world. How many countries do you think? Okay. A lot. 90 is the current, 91, the current number from the CSO statistics. That's a lot of countries sending us stuff. And uh, with freight, especially air, air flight freight, it's possible to bring live creatures, spiders, uh, lizards, anything into the country, and they're viable. And we're moving them around the country and blocking them together and moving that around. We're moving soil around to soil depots. You know, 
we have no idea what we're doing. Um, important role of fungi in nature, then just expanding a little bit. The great cyclers of nutrients is, is an awful lot of what fungi do. From the tiniest little mycenas in uh, the forest floor to uh, very, very significant sized mushrooms. Um, without fungi and bacteria as well, we drown in our own stuff and uh, everything else. Uh, we went to Innistrahill Island some years ago and everything that died there rotted in situ, mainly fungal and bacterial activity. It was quite a shock to the system because you spent the day going, oh no, there's another seagull or, a, or something else, a large um, uh, a seal or something that had washed up. And uh, it's, it's, it's not to be ignored, the great benefit of recycling. Um, so, yeah. Uh, but fungi can live just about anywhere. There's a lichen growing on some metal steps in Bear Island. And they've learned over many, many millions of years to be tough, or they started out quite tough in order to cope with uh, cosmic radiation that was getting through in, in, on the Earth. Uh, when they started developing on land. And so uh, they can live in nuclear reactor cores and use nuclear fuel. Um, they can grow on bond houses, but that's probably a, a quite a fun experience for if I don't even, <laughs> I'm not sure. And then um, on the International Space Station, I'm going way off point now, but uh, Xanthoria elegans uh, showed great potential for interplanetary uh, survival, as long as it landed somewhere you could pour water on it after a couple of years. So they're amazing materials. Geologically, uh, fungi have been extant, uh, as we have evidence for now, for a very long time, probably over 800 million, 800 million years, yes. And um, some of the weird features like prototaxites have been explained as large, now tiny geoglossums, earth tongues, if you know them, um, would have been meters tall in the past, just before forests emerged. Um, and some work has been done, some exciting work on early fungi. And so I'm looking at some of our 360 million year old ancient forests in Ireland, um, looking at fungi there too. I'm a geologist by training originally, and so I tend to look at the geology and the soils and that first before moving on. And Ireland is a very complex island geologically with an amazing array of different rock types and soil types um, emanating from that. But uh, the, it's a saucer shape with the mountains, small mountains around the edges, and in the middle a basin of uh, carboniferous limestone mainly. So there's quite a simple story, but the detail is absolutely wonderful and allows for different organisms to grow in our soils and on directly on our rock. And our climate is temperate and quite wet, but great variation from the west of Ireland, almost um, a metre difference between the extremes in Kerry to the driest parts of the east of Ireland. That's what you know. When you go to Kerry on holidays and you realise it's raining a lot, that's, that's why. <laughs> it's not in the mind. But our, our temperatures are very equitable. It does mean that we have a smaller flora and fauna than the tropics. And so there is a, a kind of moral dilemma there of do we allow industry to happen here and save it from happening in much more biodiverse areas of the world? And that's being used as an argument in geology, in particular for the excuse of mining here. We also use those minerals much more than other parts of the world that are sometimes pillaged for those elements. So we'll, we'll have to decide those on a case-by-case -case basis, I guess. Uh, just the overview, we have the island of Ireland, we're in the Atlantic Ocean, of course, and then we have these plantation forests. Uh, we also have very little of our own native forest cover. I tend to call them woodlands now, to distinguish with um, ind industrial plantation. And uh, we have wonderful tree hosts for fungi. So these are mycorrhizal 
trees that live with fungal associations in their root systems. And then Fagus sylvatica is not considered native, but I think uh, we're getting to the point where we'd be lucky to have any living trees with what we're bringing into the country and the fact that some estimates think that th a third of tree species in the world are already in extinct or in dire fear of being extinct very soon. <laughs> And um, timing of year I won't dwell on, but for fungi it's quite important for the stem and cap mushrooms. We're now reaching the end of the season and there's a short spring flush, but the autumn flush is much more important in Ireland. And where do fungi live? Uh, so we have pretty much everywhere really as an answer. Um, Anything that doesn't move for very long uh, pretty much gathers up a fungal association or two, and moss as well, but uh, rock, soil, water. We have hyphomycetes that like living in water and forming um, a healthy foam in the water. Um, and then obviously on plants and trees as epiphytes, but also uh, the saxicola species, I think, get overlooked. Um, then, yes, well, they like living and creatures as well. Okay, and just the habitat, some nice pictures to show us some scree and uh, <coughs> rock outcrop where lichens in particular like to live, but also mosses and liverworts too. Uh, at the coast, there's a particular array of lichen community that was described by an Irish lichenologist, uh, Matilda Knowles, and she came up with a three-layered colour variation that she described from Hoth, first description in the world, we think. And so this is a kind of a, an amazing observation. I think it was a Wittgenstein, among others, um, said that it's uh, explaining what everybody observes in a new way, kind of packaging things. It's a really uh, useful eureka moment when somebody does take what we all see and describes it properly. Um, obviously, I'm quite interested in woodlands, even though they're not a lot of our territorial cover, um, and quality woodlands are great for lichen diversity in particular but also what pops up from under the ground, which can be a very small uh, percentage of what is in the soil in association with trees. Uh, wet woodlands, of course, uh, and riparian woodlands, which we have two in, in abundance. Um, they are really, really special for things like Usnea, the old man's beard lichens that are really quite sensitive to air and water pollution. And to me, air and water pollution are interchangeable in Ireland because mist, fog, different ways in which we're sometimes, uh, there's a lovely phrase in Fermanagh, sometimes um, the lakes are in Fermanagh and sometimes Fermanagh's in the lakes. And it's, it's that kind of interchangeability that we have that um, organisms are taking in air and water pollution so if you have one that's unhealthy, the other will be eventually too. And then hedgerows, and I know Eamon's going to talk much more about them, but uh, the distinction here between the, the cut hedge on one side and uh, a hedge that's been left on the other, and we had that situation just exactly beside us at home, and I know from walking the dog that I've seen, on, just on bird life alone and observations, on the healthy big side, um, you have buzzards down to robins. On the other side, I saw one wren in the last year jumping out of the, the cut part of the fence. So obviously those uh, exactly right hedge, hedges rather than hedgerows are what remain across a lot of areas and it's having a huge impact. And then for the lichens too, we have bogs, fens and heath. So there are five protected lichen species under the Habitats Directive. Uh, these are Cladonia species, so like that, these fuzzy uh, bog species. Uh, Cladonia arbuscula, Azorica, Portentosa, Rangifarina, and Ciliata. But they're not protected really by name, it's more by habitat. And then I was saying, if you sit around long enough, so old trailers can even have quite a, 
a diversity of lichen cover in a short time. Then we have the mycobiome, our own biology has a whole range of fungal uh, occupants, I suppose. So we're part fungus, part bacteria, part uh, human, animal. And, and that's true of all of the animalia. Uh, but we have quite a range of uh, fungi in, in our bodies. We are walking fungi, really. <laughs> and then fungal enhancement for our living, I mean in a good way, potentially, at least for us. Uh, these are Nameko being grown in Japan, in the Nagoya area, and um, Nagano province, sorry. Um, the age of people in this area is over 100, um, like so many people, and it's, it's seen as down to the commercialization of these fungi and the eating of it preferentially. Um, in that part of Japan. Uh, just a quick run through what a, a cap and stem mushroom is like and the different features that a taxonomist would look at or a field biologist or we have some books with us that we can demonstrate uh, some of the keys and <coughs> keys are used in botany but um, in extension then in mycology to describe all of the different variations. And some keys are either or, some are multivariate keys now. But they, you take the specimen, and Howard Fox has a great phrase, that the specimen is the true thing. Everything else has to feed into that. Often you see people holding a specimen in one hand, no matter what it is, a carex often, <laughs> and um, the book in the other, and looking at the book much more than the the material itself. So always, if you're starting out, look at the material much more than the, the I know it takes a while to get in on the, the language and everything, but that's uh, the main thing. And then I mentioned my ectomycro well, mycorrhizal fungi. Ectomycorrhizal fungi are the ones with the roots of trees. And their main reason for being is to uh, themselves to live, but also they give the tree then access to heavy metals often, um, quite difficult to access metals in, in the soil and other um, nutrients. They also allow for more water to reach the plant in times of water stress. So there's quite a lot in it and um, the trees then give some things back to the fungi but mainly it would be sugars as a reward for um, their efforts. This is what mycorrhizal associations look like. So the fungal tissue, you have fungal hyphae and the mycelium uh, that is a mass of fungal hyphae, wraps around the root systems, tiny roots of trees, encouraging them to produce more roots, so that helps stabilization. And then when they fruit, you end up, so this on one side here is the mycelium um, forming the mycorrhization around the root, and then you see the lactarius deliciosus. Actually, this is lactarius deterimus, a little bit of green in it on the other side. Amanita muscaria is quite a famous one. Some people have put all world religions down to the partaking of small amounts of Amanita muscaria dried and having quite amazing visions as a result. But it can also be deadly poisonous and lead to heart attack in, in overdose situations. So not to be taken lightly. We have giant puffballs. Uh, this is considered to be the biggest recorded one, and there is a Guinness Book of Records for fungal records um, that are edible. So uh, we're looking next year to have a giant puffball, giant, giant puffball search to see who can find the biggest giant puffball in Ireland. Um, Cantharella sabarius, a lot of people would know chanterelles from edibility. We're not driven by edibility, but a lot of people are. And it, if it can bring people into looking at the wider fungal community from an initial interest in what can I eat, then um, that's, that's where we're trying to lug people. So be warned, if you come on a mushroom outing with us, you'll tend to get kind of um, proselytized about all the other wonders of fungi besides eating them. 
uh, tree lungwort. We're using, or other countries have used Loberia pulmonaria, the western seaboard uh, of the Atlantic, to identify ancient woodlands or old woodland. So being an old woodland indicator, it's this uh, kind of cabbage-like thing on, on the hazel tree. And it is a fantastic indicator of longevity of, and continuity of woodland. So it mightn't be the same trees over time, obviously, but um, some continuity would have been necessary because these fungi, these lichens, don't travel very far. And then summer truffle with tuber astevum. Uh, we have seven recorded truffle species in Ireland, and very few people talk about them. And so little is known enough, but they are out there and they do like high pH soils. So they're quite widespread in Ireland. And unfortunately, because uh, only one fungal species is, is protected in Ireland by name, uh, there would be open seasons. So we've heard reports of a truffle site being uh, let out into the wider knowledge last year, being rifled by rakes and destroyed. So... Um, we're in a quandary as to whether to release records about edible species or even species that would indicate edible species would be with them um, because there's no protection for these. Uh, you can also use mushrooms as a small parasol in times of rain or sunshine. Uh, so this, uh, yes. So fungi today in Ireland, uh, we have over five and a half thousand species recorded across the groups. Uh, there's one protective on a flora protection order, Gaia Leisha Fulgens, it used to be Fulgensia Fulgens, in County Wexford. Um, and I mentioned the five Cladonia species protected under the Habitats Directive. Um, there's some work on Agaricus bispores, where a, a big exporter of agaric mushrooms fresh uh, across Europe. And then uh, there's plenty of work going on on fungal pathogens of humans. Um, but really, uh, there aren't many people working on mycology in Ireland, especially not at the taxonomic level, because um, there's no money in it and there are no positions. And we have had students come to us, but there's no career ladder. So you have to warn somebody that they're just going to be poor for the rest of their lives if they stay here and they're interested in fungi unless we can change that, and they deserve change. So this is Fulgens uh, up close. It's called scrambled egg lichen, um, and it's, it's just in one site. So I mentioned uh, Matilda Knowles, but we have an array of very internationally famous uh, Irish mycologists when it comes to uh, Brown and Thomas Taylor in particular. So uh, there's a rich heritage there, but very few people know or care. And then Howard is the tall guy in the back there in the cream uh, jacket, um, has been going to international meetings since he was a teenager. And so this is a reunion of the um, Göteborg meeting, I think, uh, from the early 80s, was it? Uh, the first meeting was in Paris. Paris, sorry. And so, it's, uh, yeah, there's only one woman in the group either, so um, things have changed a lot in that time. But there are people from Ireland going to these meetings. Um, are we mycophobic? Not at all. And uh, I think we're lumped in with others in that guise. But uh, when we overcome our modern fear um, due to lack of access to woods and th their management for fungi, um, then I think we, we do wax lyrical, especially about field mushrooms that people did use a lot. Um, so we think this might be an early reference to a truffle hound in the Book of Kells, but it might be a bit of a stretch. And we obviously use fungi for brewing, which would have some people have linked philosophias with brewing. Um, so uh, cheese making, uh, for which Ireland is renowned. And um, now moving on to packaging and bioremediation functions. Uh, so we also have the kind of fairy ring champignon. We have a lot of interest in the supernatural and connections, especially giant football, koish puka was an old name for it. So we do have the heritage there. It's just quite hidden. 
Um, and then, of course, there's the John Hind, I think, or a similar postcard of a leprechaun sitting on a toadstool. So it's in there. It's just uh, not glaring. Um, and fungal relationships then with other species. So that, that man is holding a Termatomyces fungus that um, termites grow. Um, for food, I think for their larvae, and then there's lots of other uses, of course, um, but nesting material for birds isn't underrated, and um, food, obviously, I've seen squirrels collecting. I better make a move. Um, so carder bees use mosses, and they card the mosses into their nests, so if we're not looking after the bryophytes, what are carder bees going to make their nests out of? We do need the spore producers as well as the pollinators. And then there are moths that mimic the rock or the plant that they're on, often a lichen on a tree. And we have these fungal threats. So we've introduced a lot of them very recently in the last 50 years. We've moved so much more material around the world and much more quickly in recent times. Um, but we have uh, COVID-19, we've learned a lot about um, the, the language of how to deal with pathogens and, and the dangers, I suppose, a new um, re-emerging risk. This is honey fungus, uh, both the bootstraps that climb under the uh, bark of the tree, and you've often seen in recent times large numbers of gregariously growing honey fungus from a root stump, perhaps. Ash dieback um, is a very recent thing. It came in, it grows quite happily with the Manchunian ash in Japan. I'm just checking, yes. Um, and I should kind of really move. But Japan to Poland to Denmark to us via the Netherlands, we couldn't keep it out. Uh, European rules on trade dominate really over plant health. So by the time we could put emergency legislation in place to try to stop material coming into Ireland, that was being challenged too by international interests who wanted to keep sending us contaminated ash seedlings that we could easily have grown here ourselves. And we really want to take a long, hard look at ourselves about plant movement both within Ireland and in and out of other countries. Uh, this is Tafrina alni, so we have compromising uh, fungi of uh, the uh, fruiting bodies of our trees as well. Uh, ergot is a deadly poisonous species that's increasingly, we think, growing on grain and maybe linked to recent uh, phenomenon like staggers in wild deer in Kerry. So this was uh, its natural LSD product and it can be uh, taken a number of times. It was linked to um, uh, witch trials, but what happens is somebody eats contaminated grain with ergotine in it, you have a hallucination, but over several exposures, your fingertips start getting very hot and your uh, toes, and you start getting St. Anthony's fire, which is re-emerging. And then ultimately this leads to lysis of the blood, um, neurological problems and gangrene and death. <laughs> so it used to be mixed up with um, uh, leprosy. God, I'm really a bundle of laughs now. I better make it like. So, yes, our threats to fungi um, obviously, habitat destruction, uh, pollution, especially air pollution and agricultural air pollution in particular. Um, biocides, compaction is a huge one. Compaction, exploitation when we overdo our sustainable gathering and um, ignorance, really, at the end of the day. So here's people uh, saving the burn from being reforested by hazel. Um, how many of these piles of beautiful recovering emergent woodland have you passed on the way here today? Those piles will stay there for up to 10 years without breaking down if they're piled high enough in the middle of a field and people try to burn them there. They are the repositories for our epiphyte biodiversity, our birds, our little creatures, and that's what we're doing. And we can blame people for paying us to do that or we can do something about it. Uh, yeah, health and safety? I don't think so. A mayo hedgerow completely destroyed, wasn't going out onto the road. And then we're moving um, diseases around. So this is ash dieback 
uh, on the twigs uh, by not cleaned material going around cutting. So if you have a flaying hedge cutter and it hasn't been cleaned, it can bring ash dye back around with it. So we end up with sudden oak death and um, major plant pathogens traveling around. Ivy to us is a huge problem because it covers up the physical space for lichen and moss and liverwort cover on trees. And then I cannot overestimate ammonia air pollution, which will be at one microgram per meter cubed in moss and lichen dominated habitats, which should include bogs, but doesn't for political reasons. Um, studies on fungi, we've done quite a bit over 30 years, uh, a lot of it never read, I imagine, and are currently working on ancient woodland indicator uh, lichenized and non lichenized fungi. So uh, that's what a happy tree can look like in the west of Ireland, or used to be in the east of Ireland, but uh, a remnant population only at Paris Court and maybe in Abbey Leaks now. Um, I'll skip that. Um, we work with the Poisons Information Centre, but there's lots of things we can do better for fungi and for that as a proxy for many other things. So uh, conservation, it's deeply embarrassing that we have so few fungi on our conservation list. It's actually probably illegal and I think Albania and ourselves, probably Albania has passed us out in looking after this because I've been saying this sentence for the last 12 years and nothing has happened. Um, yeah, you know, but I think Ursula covered so much of this, but um, even things like education and can secure access to study herbarium materials, even access to what we should know already and what we should be able to get our heads around. Um, but how to protect ourselves from species coming into Ireland? I don't know how we do that. Um, it's an uphill climb, clearly. <laughs> I'm just being a bit juvenile. And um, you can have fun, fun with fungi, fun with flags, um, cookouts, and people trying in safe environments to try something. It brings them into the whole idea that fungi happen here, fungi can be safe and beneficial um, to many other organisms besides ourselves, and that there's a huge raft of them out there. So exhibitions that are kind of information and, and entertainment. Um, and then we'll have some <coughs> meetings coming up uh, at the end of the year next year. And I had loads of other things to say, and I'm sorry I didn't get to them, but I think we should probably stop me talking now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just looking down the list, Catherine. I did want to say that if we come at things from an ecocide, a legal perspective, not that Ireland is strong on environmental law, but a lot of people, well, the people who are in there are trying very hard to improve the situation. But if we put a price tag on nature, we end up with greenwashing, and we're seeing an awful lot of that. And the drowning out of the message that is really, really essential to put out there is that humans are having such a devastating effect on so much of our surroundings. And we're going to be the losers because we're, our soil is washing away from flashy flooding events that we saw again this week. And we're polluting our rivers and <coughs> forming huge deltas out to sea and polluting our marine environments with the soil that runs off because we have remove the vegetation from, that has covered and protected our soils and kept it there. 15%, I think, of our land area around the world is farmable, and we're losing that, and it's getting less fertile. And people are coming up with so many biocontrols, bioenhancers, soil conditioners, soil ameliorants. They're all fertilizers, and we're when you go in to buy a bag of uh, compost, if you don't produce your own compost, no, there will be soil ameliorants, soil conditioners in there, and you don't know what they are. And I would encourage everybody to compost their own and use their own 100%. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks. Compost. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I will stop. <laughs> Oh, I think that's a great note to end on. Um, I think I vastly overestimated how much could be said about these things and <laughs> how much time we'd have for Q&A. Um, and I see lunch is just uh, being arriving as well. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the 
Um, I see one question, so we will get, get a question in. Um, but I think one of the really kind of, well, two really good takeaways from it is that we do have to keep talking about these things. And, and you know, as you said, there are a lot of very good people in areas, a very small number of them, but they're doing really good work trying to get these, um, these issues to the forefront. And if we keep talking about them, keep telling everyone about them, and just have these conversations and tell our politicians and our, everyone about them, you know, something must happen. So, <laughs> and another is that from both of your presentations is the real need for um, local uh, nurseries with, of Irish provenance uh, seeds. So I think that would be a good one to, to, to put into any kind of submission anyone might be making. Um, we'd have one question over here and then I'll let you all go for lunch. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, uh, Maria, for an excellent presentation. I'm a fungi enthusiast and forager. My question to you is, what's your view about growing oyster mushrooms at home on spent coffee grounds? Does it have a positive or negative impact on the environment? I, I've done this as a project. It was called um, Farm Fungi, and we grew oyster mushrooms and shiitake mushrooms. Um, it was, I don't think they have a negative effect. Shiitake don't grow here naturally, and they do, um, from experiment now, I can say they really do like oak over anything else, which is intrinsic in their name in Japanese. So, uh, but oyster mushrooms are uh, saprobic, maybe slightly parasitic. I know there's uh, ash and rowan experience um, oyster mushroom infection, predation, or just a uh, breakdown for, of, of dying material. Um, I don't see that as a really difficult one at all. They are not going to mess with their mycorrhizal associations. Um, they're already here. And so I would say keep growing them on your coffee grounds and enjoying them. But what is a problem is um, the selection recently of, uh, and internationally with a third country, of things like Paxillus involutus, uh, Hebeloma species. These are mycorrhizal species that um, we can do here anyway, but selection of strains internationally is being done, bioprospecting. Used to be a dirty word, I suppose, but now there are increasing numbers of papers in the uh, 2020s with bioprospecting in the title of the paper as if it's something wonderful and to be proud of. So I think we're, Ireland is in a very vulnerable position because we have not uh, completed our Nagoya Protocol. Now Nagoya Protocol is rife with problems and in some ways has kind of inadvertently or otherwise led to a bit of neo-colonialism when it comes to uh, exploration of uh, the different ranges of organisms that are to different parts of the world and the drivers for that exploration. So if it's linked with pharma or other major money-making uh, ways of, of driving the, the investigation, it's worrying. But uh, I think for us to be willingly exporting uh, genetic material and losing our intellectual property and our genetic resource to other countries willingly or paying for the privilege, <coughs> I think that's a no-no. And the species selection needs to be uh, very carefully thought through so that toxic species or species that cause uh, toxicity in humans and perhaps other mammals and other creatures beyond that uh, really need to be carefully uh, deselected, I think, really from the the panel of potential species for this bioprospecting. 